Okay, thank you very much, Michael. And um, so the, um, well, as, as we know, the outcome of the uh, referendum on the 23rd of June has set in motion a process whereby the UK is supposed to be leaving the European Union uh, in a time frame which is uh, still to be uh, considered and decided and uh, with an outcome that is still very much uncertain. Uh, now, the specific question I will try to uh, address uh, tonight is uh, whether Brexit could offer opportunities for Indian businesses uh, in the UK and uh, these opportunities could pertain to exports of goods and services to the UK, to direct investment in the UK, and also to movement of people. Now, the approach which uh, I shall try to follow is uh, uh, very much based on uh, uh, economic theory, so I'm afraid it's somewhat uh, uh, unfashionable. Uh, I will uh, uh, try to look at uh, economic fundamentals uh, in the UK economy and to uh, examine whether uh, we can uh, say something about whether it will still be profitable for Indian companies to export to the UK or to invest in the UK, given the possible scenarios that might emerge following Brexit. And I will also have very much a macroeconomic focus, so I will try to concentrate on the big aggregates of the economy rather than on specific sectoral analysis, for which uh, I believe my uh, panelist colleagues are uh, much more competent than, than I am. So, uh, briefly, um, background uh, on uh, trade uh, in India, foreign trade specialisation. And uh, I'd like to start by um, reminding that uh, uh, until relatively recently, India was very much a closed economy. If we consider an index of trade openness, uh, export plus imports divided by GDP, uh, in 1960, this index was about uh, 11%. And uh, even uh, in 1990, it was only about 15%. So India was still very much a closed economy uh, and up until then. But uh, as we know, there have been a number of uh, economic reforms uh, that uh, took place, uh, um, really some from the mid-80s, the pro-business reforms uh, undertaken under Rajiv Gandhi, but then uh, very prominently the pro-market reforms uh, undertaken by uh, Manmohan Singh when he was a finance minister under Narasimha Rao's premiership uh, from the uh, early 1990s onwards. And uh, these reforms have resulted uh, in a, a slashing of tariffs to, to imports and a liberalisation of the economy. And uh, the index of trade openness uh, shot up from uh, about 15% in 1990 to about 50% now. So now India is a much, much more open economy than it was uh, until, uh, 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 until just about 25 years ago. Um, uh, import tariffs uh, have also been reduced quite substantially and that played uh, a huge part in the improvement of trade openness. The average import tariff was estimated to be about 80% um, in excess of 80%, actually, in 1990, and that now it's about 20%. So there was a sharp reduction in tariffs, uh, which uh, um, really promoted uh, uh, Meditizia uh, to, to import goods uh, into, the, into, into India, but also stimulated uh, Indian firms to, to become more productive and to compete in open markets. <laughs> and uh, so there was a very substantial opening up on the, of the Indian economy, uh, at the same time, there was a, a very significant change uh, in the profile of trade specialisation in India. And uh, I've done some research with colleagues at uh, SOAS, Oxford, at the Asian Development Bank. We looked at, at the profile of trade specialisation in Indian manufacturing over the past few decades. And at the beginning of the process of reform, India had a comparative advantage in relatively low-tech products. So in products with a relatively low technological component. But uh, there's been a very substantial shift in the pattern of uh, trade specialization. And now um, India has a comparative advantage in uh, sectors with a fairly high technological component, which include uh, medicinal and pharmaceutical products, uh, passengers' motor vehicles, organic chemicals, uh, and of course, uh, IT, uh, IT software. So there was uh, an improvement in the, um, in the technological content of uh, Indian specialisation and also at the same time a shift towards uh, some of the most dynamic sectors of world trade. So some of the sectors that are growing fastest 
in terms of global trade. So India was uh, really in, a, in an excellent position to take advantage of its uh, uh, opening up of markets and of the expansion in world trade. And uh, <coughs> interestingly, uh, trade liberalization played a very significant role in, uh, in this process. And uh, uh, we have been able to establish, for instance, that the sectors which experienced the sharpest decline in tariffs were also the sectors that uh, experienced the, uh, in the greatest uh, increase in productivity. So the sectors that became the most open to, to world trade uh, also were those where uh, the productivity of Indian firms increased the most. So it looks as if uh, liberalization was uh, on balance a very um, profitable uh, uh, process for, for the Indian economy. Now, <clears throat> what is status today of the trade relations, relations between the UK and India? And India runs actually a trade surplus with the UK. So it exports into the UK more than uh, it imports. And uh, <clears throat> the main exports to the UK are textiles, machinery and electrical equipment, and chemical products. The main imports are uh, precious metals, uh, uh, mainly silver uh, from the UK, and uh, also some base metals. And uh, Indian companies are also significantly the third largest foreign investor in the UK uh, after the uh, US and, uh, and China. Uh, but uh, still, from an Indian point of view, the trade with the UK is only a relatively modest share of total trade. The UK accounts for only about 3% of the total merchandise export from India. So only about 3% of total exports from India are directed to the UK. And the bilateral trade with the UK accounts for only about 2% of Indian international trade. So the UK is still... Uh, a relatively minor player when it comes to uh, Indian foreign trade. And uh, there was also, well, if we look at the trade uh, uh, of, the, of India with, uh, with, uh, with uh, the rest of Europe, uh, that's quite significant because until a few years ago, about uh, three quarters of total Indian investment in the European Union came to the UK, and now it's only about a half. So in terms of foreign direct investment, uh, we have seen a, a redirection already uh, away from the UK and towards uh, other uh, European countries. So, um, given this background, um, what could uh, um, Brexit imply uh, for the export of goods uh, from India to the UK, for the investment uh, into the UK, and for the movement of people? Uh, now, in terms of uh, um, um, exports, into the UK? Well, that will depend on what will happen to the uh, demand for imports in the UK. And uh, uh, the main factors will be the domestic demand in the UK economy, which uh, in turn is affected by exchange rate and by tariffs and uh, non-tariff barriers to trade. So briefly, um, domestic demand in the UK, in the short run, uh, um, we have seen a, a great increase in uncertainty and uh, uh, post-Brexit. Now, we, uh, the effects uh, of uh, the increase in uncertainty have been mitigated by a very uh, aggressive and effective policy by the uh, monetary and fiscal authorities, especially the Bank of England, which intervened very, very promptly and effectively to uh, implement expansionary monetary policies, keep interest rates down, expand its programs of quantitative easing, inject liquidity into the market, and therefore um, staving off uh, the risk of a, of a recession. So I, I think the Bank of England, uh, despite criticism, took uh, the only really sensible course of action, given these circumstances. And given fiscal policy, the Treasury has uh, all but abandoned its plans of fiscal consolidation in a very short time frame. So the expansionary monetary and fiscal policies have helped uh, uh, reduce the risk of a, uh, of a recession. But uh, in, the, in the longer run, um, what will depend to what will happen to the UK economy? And uh, well, we know from growth theory that there are three main factors uh, that determine the growth of an economy: uh, labour input and improvement in uh, the labour force, uh, a capital investment, and technical progress. Now, in terms of labour input, uh, um, this uh, the possible um, um, 
restric possible restrictions to immigration could uh, uh, have a, a negative effect on the rate of growth of the, of the Indian economy. And uh, it's quite significant that only a few days after the outcome of the referendum, one of the main credit rating agencies, Fitch, downgraded the rating of uh, UK uh, sovereign bonds. And one of the reasons was that uh, reduced immigration would uh, uh, reduce uh, the rate of growth of the UK economy. So even these very hard-nosed uh, uh, credit rating agencies could see that uh, immigration is actually a positive, has a positive effect on, uh, on the UK economy. Um, so there could be skill shortages. And also it could be, uh, um, well, to anticipate the decline in exchange rate would make it less profitable to settle in the, into the UK because the real value of uh, remuneration in sterling will be, will be less. So it would be less um, attractive to move to the UK uh, given the weakness of, uh, of sterling. So um, um, in terms of capital, well, it's uh, quite uh, well, uh, um, and, and investment uh, is quite well accepted in the economics literature that reduced trade could, uh, could uh, uh, adversely affect uh, the investment opportunities uh, and uh, investment uh, um, profitability. So the uh, loss of uh, single market access, the uh, difficulties of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, trading with, uh, with Europe uh, could, uh, could uh, act as a disincentive to, to, to invest. And uh, finally, technical progress and uh, research and development. Now, the UK is uh, quite advanced in the field of research and development at some of the best universities in the world. And often these universities have been able to create synergies with industry. But uh, uh, many of these synergies will be at risk from a possible cut in uh, funding to, to research. And uh, already a, a number of research institutions uh, have uh, um, expressed their concerns about uh, the reduction in funding for, for research. So in the long run, this uh, potentially negative uh, consequences on uh, uh, labor, capital and investment and technical progress could lead to a smaller economy, an economy that grows at a, at a, a smaller pace. Um, now, the exchange rate um, course also affects the demand for imports and uh, the depreciation of the pound sterling has uh, um, increased the competitiveness of uh, UK firms, but made it more, for expensive, made it more expensive to uh, purchase uh, imp commodities produced abroad. So the depreciation of the sterling has uh, reduced the competitiveness and the profit margins for Indian firms who are seeking to uh, export to the, to the UK. So that's an additional uh, um, threat that they, that they face. Um, of course, uh, there could be uh, some uh, uh, substitution against uh, imports from the European Union if uh, uh, some um, trade barriers are, are put in place, uh, then uh, uh, British consumers might redirect towards uh, goods produced uh, in India or uh, other Commonwealth countries or from non-EU countries. Um, but that will depend very much on uh, possible barriers to trade and uh, on the outcome of the uh, trade negotiations. And uh, I think it's fair to say that at present nobody knows uh, what uh, the outcomes will be, what uh, will be the access, if any, to the, to the single market, and what uh, bar tariff and non-tariff barriers will be put in place. Of course, a very important non-tariff barrier is the financial passport that uh, um, companies based in the UK need in order to be trade in the euro area. And so um, barriers to trade could also um, uh, either improve or reduce the, uh, or, or the, the potential for, British, for, for Indian firms to, to, to trade with the UK. Um, now, very briefly, determinants of inward foreign direct investment, and uh, again, this depends on the density of infrastructure in the, in the UK. This is one of the uh, empirical regularities uh, found in the uh, literature on, uh, on, on FDI. And uh, we all know that uh, the infrastructure in the UK needs uh, a lot of investing. And we've all seen the difficulties of, uh, of uh, planning for, for improvement in infrastructure, the um, uh, uh, additional um, 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 airport runway 
um, the, and, the, and the controversies uh, that have risen are testimony to that. So uh, the UK should really invest heavily in infrastructure in order to improve its attractiveness as a destination for, for FDI. And uh, it should, uh, yes, try to, to um, uh, remove uh, um, restrictions uh, even to um, uh, human capital uh, um, uh, movements. Um, which leads me to the, to the last point, the determinants of migration flows. Um, so apart from exporting to, into the UK or investing into the UK, um, why should professionals from India uh, move, to the, move to the UK? Um, there are historic links common language, a similar education system, which would make it easier for, for uh, Indian professionals to, to move to the UK. And uh, there would also be a, a skill shortage in the UK in crucial sectors, such as in the health sector, that uh, again could make it uh, more profitable for Indian professionals to, to, to move. And uh, high qualified Indian professionals could benefit from a point entry system. Um, against that, uh, the current uh, UK visa system is not particularly friendly to Indian nationals. And uh, for instance, uh, we have experienced a decline in the number of Indian students uh, in UK uh, universities. And uh, um, that's something that uh, should really be addressed uh, by the UK government and the uh, Home Office. And uh, because at present uh, the rules uh, make it very, very difficult for uh, Indian people to, to locate uh, in, uh, in the UK. And that's nothing to do with the EU, it's just uh, a domestic policy of the, of the Home Office. So if I could uh, conclude very, very briefly, uh, yes, uh, so um, I believe that it is uh, fair to, uh, to, to assume that uh, as a consequence of Brexit, uh, uh, a very likely scenario is that the UK will be a much smaller economy with a, a volatile currency and, uh, and uh, the UK uh, will find itself in a very, very difficult position in terms of negotiating trade deals, which means that uh, really it will be in a very, very weak bargaining position, uh, which would be an advantage for India. India could uh, exploit the weakness uh, of the uh, UK in terms of uh, negotiating um, uh, profitable deals. Uh, certainly, the UK has insufficient capacity for trade uh, negotiations. So, um, I believe that India would be in a privileged position to take uh, advantage of some opportunities, uh, given uh, the um, great expansion in its uh, um, um, global outlook uh, and uh, foreign trade. And uh, uh, Indian companies could still find it profitable to buy uh, UK assets, uh, because they could buy them quite cheaply. Uh, because of the weak startling. And also, if there is a recession, or they could uh, buy uh, uh, companies in, in distress, uh, which uh, would make it even cheaper for them. Um, of course, the profits will be denominated in startling, which will uh, uh, possibly not be worth very much. But uh, I, I think uh, um, there is a possibility also of uh, India playing off uh, uh, the UK and the EU against each other, because there are trade negotiations with the EU that uh, are going on since 2007 and uh, uh, are still stalling. So maybe India could play um, the uh, UK and the EU and try to get a better deal. But uh, um, I, I think that you know, with careful trade negotiations, uh, there is a scope for a trade partnership with the UK. But uh, uh, I will see very much uh, in this partnership with the UK as a, as a junior partner. Thank you. Thank you very much. John, the agreed running order was you next, if that's okay. Um, what a frightening thought. <laughs> India playing EU and the, and the UK off against each other. I don't think you get far. But you might get further with the, with the UK than you did with the EU. Um, thank you, Michael. Um, great to be here. Um, I'm often in London. I live in Delhi. I have done for many years, as you've heard. Though I'm usually only here in the summer, but it's great to be here for an extra week and be able to be here at my second um, SOAS event. Um, I've been more involved um, thinking over the last couple of days and writing about Ra after Ratan Tata's palace coup um, of what one might now call Cyrexit um, as opposed to Brexit. And that led me today to think about the similarities. Um, the UK's vote to leave the EU and Tata Sun's vote, most boardroom vote to separate itself from Cyrus Mystery, do have at least one parallel. And that's that both involve a top person 
um, who is convinced that he in one case and she in the other, that what they think is right and is right and will be driven through. And that goes for both those people, so it would be interesting to see how they both fare in the future. I think I know which one is probably the more flexible, um, and, and that's a she. Um, uh, but I'll, uh, and that will come through, of course, that um, flexibility, if it ever does happen, on visas, but that's a long haul. Um, the, the Financial Times had a revealing profile on Theresa May, just as an aside, um, based on a reporter going to the um, Oxfordshire village where she grew up and where her vicar, her, her father, um, was a strict high Anglican vicar. Um, and that was part of her breeding and, 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 and the, the things that make her as she is now. And she said in a Conservative camp campaign video uh, a few weeks ago, which was included in this article, I got an early interest in politics and he, he, that's her father, always encouraged me to see no boundaries, no barriers, just go out there and do the best you can and aim high. And that I thought when I read that is what we've been seeing with Theresa May on all sorts of things. And um, it'll be interesting to see how she behaves when she gets to Delhi in about 10 days' time. Um, so now we have this driven politician as Prime Minister who comes to number 10 with what many might think of as baggage from her time in the homes, um, as Home Secretary which in the context of this session, of course, is her refusal to relax um, visa regimes, and I'll be coming back to that in a moment as well. But let me first take a step back and look at some of the background, and first the positives for the UK. It's, it may be good, um, um, from an Indian point of view, that it's leaving the EU, because India does not like dealing with federations of countries. It prefers to deal direct with top people running a single country. Um, and although this is not strictly relevant to this session either, um, that's most poignant, of course, on defence deals. Um, I never thought the Eurofighter in the recent um, contest for uh, a fighter jet contract, I never thought the Eurofighter ever stood a chance against um, France's Dassault Rafale, um, because it is so much simpler to arrange all those things that have to be agreed and arranged on defence deals with a single country. Um, India's also had, I thought I might get a laugh for that, and I didn't get any reaction at all. Um, India's, well, I, I expected silence here, but I thought some, somebody else might react. Um, uh, India's also had, a, had dreadful experiences with the EU. Um, since some 16 rounds of meetings, as we've just heard, um, on, on a free trade agreement um, since 2007, and still nothing concluded, held up by the EU wanting India to lower duties on autos and wine and spirits, which India's interests resist, plus stricter intellectual property protection, which India probably says is adequate as it is. Um, and India wanting easy access for temporary IT staff and students in particular. There's also um, been frustration on an India-EU summit, which eventually happened this summer after endless delays. Mainly, and this shows how dysfunctional the EU is, mainly because India had locked up in the Delhi Italian embassy pending trial two Italian Marines who had killed two Indian fishermen off the Kerala coast in 2012. Consequently, Italy blocked the summit for many years until this year. How dysfunctional can you get? Um, moving on, I asked a very senior Ministry of External Affairs official casually a week or two ago what he thought of doing a post-Brexit FTA deal. Um, he paused because his mind was on other synonyms, um, but then said, well, it's not my patch, but if it was, I'd do it tomorrow. If only it was so simple. Um, the UK apparently cannot negotiate um, until um, Brexit is through. That's the official line, and that's what I was told at the British High Commission in Delhi when I checked formally before I, before I came here, though lots of people seem to believe that's not so, and I can't imagine um, that there won't be um, behind-the-scenes talks, at least between Britain and non-European countries, even if it, can't, it doesn't happen between India um, and, uh, and, and, and European countries. Um, but the issues that have stopped the EU FTA would presumably be equal, e equal size problems on, on one with Britain, because Theresa May would be determined to keep strong visa controls and to maximise UK exports that probably wouldn't give India what it wanted. But I leave, and I leave it to the experts to tell me whether an FTA is really a primary aim that we all ought to get terribly worried about, or rather whether there aren't really much more sensible things that you can do. I mean, journalists love things that you can just write about simply. I often think that FDI, as, 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 as the initials 
lead to endless stories about foreign direct investment in newspapers which really aren't worth the space and enable people like me to divert, not not to bother with the much more complicated stories which don't have nice little initials at the top and percentages and things. And I suspect that, a, you know, will you do an FTA, you won't do you an FTA is the sort of question that journalists and the ones sitting at the back will instantly ask with a, with a pen in their hand or a television camera and microphone in their hand um, as, as a quick answer when in fact one ought to be talking about... Um, broadening relationships and, and developing things in, in real terms. Um, the UK India is of course based on a very strong and historic relationship, com complex and contradictory of a former colonial power and it's part of its former empire which is now immensely more important. But it's limited in real terms. Look at David Cameron, he visited India three times um, in 2010, twice in 2000, a total of three times in 2010 and 2013 but had little to show for his efforts, showing, in my view, that the UK is just not a top priority in Delhi. Then Narendra Modi came to London for what was a very good visit, but my main memories, and I was here for, for, during it, are of his giant tamasha in, in Wembley Stadium, and of, the, and of all the demonstrations that shut part of Whitehall and Parliament Square. Does anybody remember anything else? I'm open to be corrected on this, but I haven't seen much happening as a result of that visit. I wrote on my blog at the time, there was nothing dramatic or unexpected in the announcements that the two sides said, that the two sides said total some nine billion pounds. But there were useful initiatives on climate change, defense collaboration, cyber cooperation, and counter-terrorism. The test, um, Dinesh, is whether anything has happened on those four things, which were the main ones, um, since November last year. There was a list of over 20 commercial deals, most of which I wrote would have happened without the Modi visit. They ranged from a Mazam Two Swords waxworks in Delhi, which for some reason or other topped one of the lists, and I haven't seen that happening, um, from a Mother, Madam Two Swords waxworks in Delhi to mostly smallish banking, insurance, healthcare, and energy arrangement, uh, investments in both countries. But this doesn't just apply to Britain. If you total up all the million dollars, and we're moving to dollars now, that, um, that Narendra Modi has signed, or, uh, signed up to, and we've all written about around the world, it comes to about 150 billion. Of which, dollars, of which scarcely anything has happened from any country, even Japan, which has got very f fed up with, with not much happening. So although I'm arguing it as part of the fact of the, the argument that the <coughs> India, UK, that India is, sorry, that the UK is not that important to India, it is a general problem of implementing these things. Um, and now Theresa May is about to visit India, and no doubt all sorts of good things will be said. Um, but the realities are that she will be stubborn on visas, just as India will be questioning about whether she intends to produce, um, what, what she intends to produce out of her Brexit talks, which she probably won't tell them. Um, I've read um, that, Dinesh, um, you, you, you've been saying optimistic things about short-term visas. Quoting you, I think it was in the Hindustan Times, and I'm not sure if it's PTI or not, I hope we will have a deal on Britain facilitating short-term visas for students, academic, academicians, I always call them academics, academicians and businessmen from India. These categories should not be in the migration list, Pat and I, sorry about that, told reporters. And then the, re the report went on to say, India wants Britain to extend visa concessions given to the Chinese to be extended to India uh, on six months to two-year visas for £87. Pounds. Well, I hope you're right, but I fear you might be wrong. I'm told that Amber Rudd, the new Home Secretary, got nowhere with Theresa May when she suggested in the summer that students should be excluded from immigration stats, and of course so they should be. Um, and it would be a break of faith for a faith-oriented Prime Minister to change that. Also, sadly, India's just not in the same league as China. Um, the new administration here is, thank God, pulling back from the pro-China, extreme pro-China stance that was led by George Osborne. Um, but reality is reality. And finally, to investments. How am I doing on time? All right. Um, and finally, investments. No one is keen... Um, to invest in the UK while the future um, of its relations with the EU, EU are so unclear. Um, I reckon the EU, the, the investments will go ahead if an Indian company wants to buy a British company which is based here and which um, has got a lot of sales in the UK or in non-European countries. But it will not, I reckon, there will not be investments um, in, in fresh ventures um, where the future will be more uncertain. For example, and I'm, my use of Tata here is a coincidence from what I was saying earlier. Tata would, would go ahead, I guess, to buy Jaguar Land Rover because it's firmly based here and has got strong UK sales. 
Um, but it wouldn't have gone ahead on chorus, which it shouldn't have anyway, um, because of that depends much more on relations with Europe. Um, much has been made in, 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 in some newspapers um, and by the, the, the Brits um, of an invest a £600 million deal by an Indian company called Intas to buy a UK and Irish business called Activists, which was uh, pharmaceuticals, I think, which was presented as being evidence that India companies were still buying into the UK. But in that case, of course, the companies also got a base in Ireland, so they win both ways because Ireland will still be in the EU. And the FT, I'm s sad to say, this has just came up as I was leaving my flat. The FT is running a story today saying that the volume of Indian investment into the UK has plummeted this year according to figures from Greenfield Investment Monitor FDI Markets and FDA FT Data Service Organization. Indian companies have announced Greenfield investments of $172 million from January through to August of this year, compared with $917 million in the same period last year. 16 projects were unveiled in those months, um, compared with 29 last year, and no investments have been larger than $40 million coming in, in from India to the UK. Um, and that comes at a time when overall investments from India abroad have almost doubled from 8.7 billion to 16 billion. Being the FT, my old newspaper, it, is of course, it does of course caution that it's too early to blame Brexit for this, um, but it surely is a sign of things to come. So to sum up, strong binding relationship between the two countries which will continue and could grow stronger once the EU is established outside the EU. I've been talk once the UK is established outside the EU, I've been talking about things much more in the shorter term. Um, the Indian government and the Indian, business, in Indian businesses, and I'm sure we'll hear this from, from our Ficky friend, would have much preferred the UK to stay in the EU, and maybe I should have said that right at the beginning. Um, an FTA is, prob FTA is probably problematic, um, as our relaxed visa instructions and investment into the UK will be very, very slow. It's all total uncertain, totally uncertain. Basically, no one knows. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, uh, Pasquale. Um, November is a very important month for India-UK relations. Uh, Alistair Cook's England cricket team goes from Bangladesh to, to India to play five test matches. And if you read Crick Info, there's an article today that says Alistair Cook could be the person to take over Sachin Tendulkar's batting records. Um, and he's played an un uninterrupted, I think, 100 test matches in a row, something, something like that. And he could be the number one. He's 31 years old. He's got five, six years of experience left to him. And of course, November is also important because Theresa May is going to India. Um, and we're, with a business delegation of, of 150 uh, from the pharma sector, from the chemical sector, I industrial sector. Um, just following on from um, a few of the thoughts that we've heard already, India and UK do share great historical bonds. There are 1.5 million Indians in the UK, um, and uh, there, are, there are a number of bilateral initiatives that have, have um, uh, matured and flourished over the last few years. But when David Cameron first went to India in November 2010 as Prime Minister, he said that he wanted to double trade between India and the UK within five years. Uh, so that's a 100% increase. In the subsequent five years, trade probably went up by about 10 to 15%. Of that, we heard that India has been exporting a lot more. Uh, Indian exports to, to the UK have gone up by a lot more. Um, UK exports to India have actually fallen over the last couple of years by, by value. Um, and and this, this represents a, a, a real conundrum for, for I think, India-UK watches. I, I haven't got to, to the bottom of this. I think investment figures are pretty robust both ways. So we heard that India is the third largest investor in the UK, uh, and UK trade and investment figures show something like 9,300 jobs were either created or safeguarded by Indian companies in the UK in the last uh, last uh, uh, fiscal. And it was a similar story the year before. But on the trade side, um, in the last five years, since that David Cameron announcement, the number of uh, the, the footprint that the UK India Business Council has in India has expanded very significantly. So UK India Business Council is a um, UK government funded organization to promote trade between the, the, the two countries and, and support UK businesses in India. 
Um, government funding for, for UKIBC last year was 2.4 million. It's expanded its um, services in Indian cities quite significantly over the last two and a half years. Uh, the diplomatic core that the UK government has in India has grown to the biggest it is anywhere in the world, uh, much higher than it is in China in, in the same period. The number of deputy high commissions Britain has in India ha have expanded quite significantly and they cover different regions of India. Um, uh, a, uh, the, the UK ARE grant system has also um, had uh, kind of additional injections of funding over the, last, uh, over the last few years. And so there are a lot of bilateral engagements uh, like this. Um, Indians are the second highest uh, in terms of uh, remittances to Indians here, the second highest in terms of remittances back home to India. I think Nigeria is first, India is second, then Pakistan and others uh, are in the list. So there are a number of economic ties there, um, whether it's in the education sector, whether it's um, you know in, in the other sectors we heard of, uh, pharma, textiles, etc. But the the amount of effort that has gone in quite evidently from the UK side has not necessarily materialized into uh, UK exports to India increasing uh, significantly over the last five years. Brexit, of course, poses an additional uh, level of uncertainty, as, as we've heard. And um, uh, although the one thing that's certain in business is change, the one thing that all businesses would want is certainty. Um, and so Brexit would, would clearly... Uh, clearly make things more, more difficult. The, the pound has fallen 16%, 18% um, in the last couple of months. Um, and, uh, and that has, has posed, uh, uh, posed a big issue um, in terms of those, those trade statistics. So textiles is the, the, the biggest of the imp, uh, exports from India to, to the UK. Um, in value terms, even if uh, the export figures are not much affected. In volume terms, they will be definitely affected. So um, following on from the, the economics we, we heard about earlier, the, the, the elasticity of demand for something like textile, so if you go to the high street and, and buy something from John Lewis or Primark or elsewhere, that elasticity of demand for textiles is much greater. So the fact that these, these goods cost 18% more will mean that UK consumers buy a lot less from India. In some of the other sectors where there are bigger deals possible, um, in the pharma sector and elsewhere, maybe uh, it won't be a question of a moderation in demand. Maybe it will just be a postponement postponement in some of those big deals that, that are announced. And we, we just heard that the deal flow activity has, has fallen. I want to just quickly go back to, to, to the early 90s when, um, when the Indian uh, markets were opened up. At that time, Looking at the India-UK relationship, it was probably quite uneven. So uh, India maybe needed the UK more than was vice versa the case. Fast forward to today, India uh, only has 3% of its trade with, with the UK, and the UK in a post-Brexit world probably needs India more than, than is the case the other way around. Partly it's to do with trade opportunities and investment opportunities into the UK. Partly it's also engagement with the diaspora that are already here. Uh, Peter Mandelson, who used to be trade commissioner in, in the EU, his, his think tank or his consultancy that he set up afterwards, uh, I think it's called General Council, uh, they published a report just after Brexit that said that India should be, for the UK, the 11th most important country, following China first, the US, and then I think 10th was Switzerland, and then India was, was 11th. Uh, and that was based on um, on a different lens from from where some of us in in the public affairs arena in the India India UK space see it, um, and that's that's a very uh, that's a very sobering assessment. But juxtapose that with Theresa May choosing to go to India with such a big delegation, um, the answer of what happens after Brexit between India UK, I'm not quite sure, and and hopefully. Uh, the, the High Commissioner, the Acting High Commissioner, will sh shed more light on it. <laughs> um, in terms of uh, any trade negotiations, formal trade negotiations that can happen, we've already heard that um, uh, the Article 50 needs to be triggered, then Britain needs to leave the, the EU, and then only can there be formal negotiations between India and, and the UK. 
but the the same issues that uh, were an issue uh, were, were impediment between India and Europe negotiating an FTA will definitely stay. Um, so uh, the tariffs on on automobiles and wine and spirits that you mentioned that's definitely an issue. So that's a that's very much a, a tariff barrier whereby tariffs on the Indian side are much higher than they are on the European side. So if if the negotiation is around reducing barriers on both sides, then the barriers on the Indian side have to reduce by more than they do on the European side. So European exporters would benefit more. In terms of non-tariff barriers, um, the EU has much stricter packaging controls, has much stricter labeling controls and, and quality controls generally. Qual quality standards generally. And um, we saw that a couple of years ago. There was particularly a motive issue for the Indian diaspora in the UK, where Alfonso mangoes from India, uh, as well as a couple of other vegetables, were not, not let into the EU because of those uh, quality controls. Um, those non-tariff barriers in the EU make it much more difficult for Indians to I India to export here. Uh, so that's been a that's been a stumbling block. Both those ta tariff and non-tariff barriers will be an issue in a in an India UK agreement too. On the IP side, the EU would like um, uh, India to actually adhere to much stronger IP laws than have already been agreed in mutual uh, kind of international forums like the WTO. So in a sense, IP negotiations have moved from uh, multilateral forums like WTO to bilateral uh, investment discussions. Um, that is also something that, that India uh, would, would and has over the last 16 rounds of negotiation pushed back on uh, because we believe very much that, that our IP protection is on par with the best in the world and in some cases go, goes beyond that. Um, so if, if those challenges exist between the EU and India, they will exist in terms of negotiating some kind of formal agreement between between the UK and India. Um, India, however, the thing that has changed over the last two, two and a half years since the new government has come in, and this goes back to my earlier point that maybe in 1991 the two countries were, um, uh, there was an asymmetry of, of, uh, of power, or there, there was a kind of a different balance. Uh, now that's changed and India has become much more confident on the global scale. Um, more confident in terms of the way it uh, it portrays itself, and uh, events like Narendra Modi coming to Wembley have definitely uh, helped with that. Whether there was a tangible set of outcomes in terms of trade and, and investments came out of it, that's one part of it. But another part of it is also to get uh, after you take into account uh, how much, uh, what the wind chill was. It was probably minus two or minus three degrees. It was really cold in, in that that stadium. But there were sixty thousand people there. Um, and they were there to listen to, to Prime Minister Modi. Who else does that happen for in terms of global leaders? Uh, for India to be standing on a global stage um, much taller than it may have done in the past, that then means uh, it's much more confident in terms of negotiating uh, trade deals, it's much more confident in the way it presents itself, um, and it means that when, when the two Prime Ministers meet, um, just in a few days' time, uh, there, there's a real uh, meeting of, of, of equals where Theresa May can, um, can offer uh, and discuss options post-Brexit and the Indian Prime Minister can equally say, uh, well, Delhi is the place where a lot of uh, Prime Ministers come to now. So just, uh, just a few days ago in the Fiki office in Delhi, um, we, had a, we had a big investment forum uh, with France and we discussed... Um, uh, a lot of ways in which the French government is, is working with India uh, often much more closely, uh, not just with defense, but in a, in a whole range of other areas. Um, so I think uh, there is great opportunity. Um, I think the standard line that uh, in, in the India-UK public affairs space, in any speech that, that's to do with something like this, we always try and talk about is, India and the UK are great partners, and there is a great opportunity in, in that bilateral relationship. Uh, and there is much more to do. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and, and where you, I think, where you put the emphasis and, and where uh, you concentrate the efforts depends very much on, on which side of the fence you're sitting on. Where if, if you're an Indian businessman looking to the UK, there's greater uncertainty. Um, not just with the exchange rate, but with policy and with, with regulation. 
Um, there's greater uncertainty with, with immigration. Uh, and Amber Rudd's comments in the uh, Conservative Party conference, again, reinforced those opinions and, and those, that, that view uh, in, in India. Um, if you're looking at it as an Indian businessman coming to the UK, um, that bilateral scenario is probably different. If you're one of the, the tech businesses that have joined the, the delegation going to India in a couple of weeks, that view is probably different. Um, if, you are, uh, if you are in Brussels and you're, you're looking at India and thinking that the next round of negotiation may go easier, then perhaps that also is a different perspective, given that we've seen in the last few days that um, the EU trade deal with Canada hasn't worked because of the Walloons, because of one region in, in, in one country. Um, trade negotiations take a long time. They take a lot of negotiation. Um, but as we've already heard today, uh, there, can be, uh, there can be many other things we can look on which are maybe piecemeal, but they may add up to, to much more than the, the, the sum of the parts. Um, I try to be as, as, as pragmatic as, as I can in terms of uh, post-Brexit uh, relations between the two countries. Um, but uh, the next couple of weeks will tell uh, whether uh, whether there are some significant new announcements and some progress made in terms of trade policy. And the next two and a half months will tell where Alistair Cook will be in terms of <laughs> catching up with Sachin Tendulkar. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I don't know about final words, but thank you very much. Um, I'm going to take off from him as to Indians not looking at UK as being a country of importance. If you look around the world, how many other countries can you think of who has the same kind of things at UK? You know, it's still one of the five largest economies in the world. It's a member of the Security Council. He's got a large Indian diaspora, umbilical relationship, uh, historical relationship. You know, if you look at around the world and you want to develop relations, it will always be in the top ten or top five. Well, that, that doesn't mean that maybe the importance has come down. But overall, in terms of strategy, in terms of relations with countries around the world, it still is one of the top countries. So let's not pull UK down for the time being. It's still an important country. And uh, we really value our relation with it. But on this question of Brexit... I asked myself the other question. If there was no Brexit, what would have happened to India-UK trade? Would you have just muddled along or were we planning something big? And there were lots of plans on the anvil. Prime Minister Modi gave a fillip and what um, Pratik said just now, the British High Commission expanding its uh, presence in India showed that there were plans of doing more in the future. You won't increase, if you're a company, you won't increase your number of people unless you're planning to do something with it. And the same with India. So essentially, there were a lot of things which were on the anvil which were going to happen no matter whether Brexit happens or doesn't happen. So what happens when Brexit happens? When Brexit happens, and right now we don't know what contours it's going to take, but there will be both opportunities and challenges for India. Now, we are unlike other countries. Many of the Indian companies have a presence in UK because they want to target Europe also. So which means that many of those companies will follow the UK negotiations on Brexit very closely because it affects them deeply. But none of them are waiting. Many of the companies are already asking for licenses in Europe, like many other American countries and others. Because you see, the licensing authority in the European Union are going to have about 5,000 companies from Britain going in to ask for licenses. And if you take 5,000 companies, imagine how long it will take you to just approve them. It will take you at least two to three years. They don't have the capacity of licensing authorities to approve so much. Even if it takes a week to license, clear a license, you're looking at 5,000 companies. It's a huge. So nobody is waiting. For many companies, Brexit has already happened. So they are already on their way out. And we're getting the feedback that all of them want to find a present. They want to hedge their bets. If tomorrow UK has a great deal with, on Brexit, Wonderful. But if it doesn't have, they all want to hedge their bets. And this is what countries are doing. Uh, I go back to something they said that David Cameron went to India thrice and he had nothing to show for it. But he got 40% of Indians to move from the labor to tourists. 
See, the point with it is, he didn't go just for trade and commercial deals and others. That's all part of the things the Prime Minister does. But he's also a political animal. He went there because he recognized the importance of the Indian diaspora in UK. And he went there, he was, a, he was a man who understood that the Tories need to bring in the large amount of the votes that are in the Indian. So he got 40% now moved from Labour to Tories. So he succeeded. Now the same, the same reason Prime Minister May wants to go to India. Because it's important for her to show both to her people that she is going out and doing deals while she has a negotiating with the EU. And she also wants to tell the EU that I have other options. Now, everybody says uh, there's weakness in the UK. The UK knows it, it's weak. But why is it going out and doing? Because it knows it cannot sign any deal till Brexit is over. So it really doesn't, it's not weak. It'll just negotiate, it'll find what are the low-hanging fruit, what are the parameters that you can put in, what is the system that you put in place. And end, end of two years when Brexit happens, it looks to see what it has a deal with you. So then it will decide whether it has to agree on the things it has agreed with the rest of the world or not. But it cannot actually come to a final thing before Brexit. So this is games all countries play. And we will play the thing. I'm, you know, sometimes I'm worried. Please don't quote me. Okay, I'm being very honest here. Okay. So these are games countries play. And we all have to play the game because it's in the interest of each country. Each country goes to another country because of its own interest. Prime Minister May is not going to India because it, uh, it's in India's interest. It's going because it's in Britain's interest. The same for us. We're not going to pull her down because she has strong views on certain things. We'll see what we can work with her. She's a Prime Minister who's shown to the world that India is important. I'm coming to India. And we're not going to be petty about it and say, oh, you're coming on a week's ticket, so we're going to make you suffer for it. No way. We're going to be as gracious as you can. And we will tell her, yes, how can we help you? And how can we work together? Because for us, it's very clear. In this time of uncertainty, we have to prove ourselves to be a certain partner. Like a companies need certainty, same way Britain needs to know for certain that India has its back. And that's something we're going to tell them. We have your back. And here I will debunk some of the small myths that are there all over. First of all, visa. Okay, we speak about it. But frankly... It doesn't concern us too much. You know, we speak about it because the industry wants us to speak about it. Other people want us to speak about it. Look, think of it. If Indian students go and get a visa to come to UK, the Australian High Commissioner the other day was saying he's very happy because the whole of them are going to Australia. Some of them are going to US. They're even going to Germany, France, all of the country. The loss is Britain's. It's not ours. You know, so it's not us who are pushing Britain to get more Indian students. It's in Britain's interest to get the students in because their whole research and development and students and universities, everything depends on this. So Britain has to take a decision. When I say, I say it because it's in Britain's interest. If not, we have options. It's not that we don't have options. It's the same thing for anything like tier two visas. I mean, there's this whole thing in industry that tier two visas have become more expensive. You have to have 41,000 pounds, which anyway, with 18% drop, it's now more affordable. But... The point with it is, Britain's financial services industry, the IT industry, the commercial services industry, depend on these short-term workers. And for them, it's very important to understand that the city of London will suffer if they don't get these people. Not only this, the intra-company intra transfers. I mean, these are things which they know. Now, they can't do it because of their political compulsions or maybe because, like, my friend, he says, there is somebody who doesn't believe that they help. Now, the point is, you can be different as a Home Secretary, but you will be different as a Prime Minister. That I'm very sure of. Because there you see the larger picture. So, things, it's not the end of the road. I mean, in Britain, everybody understands. I mean, whomsoever I talk to understands that this is the situation. If Britain has to do well later on, they have to make st take steps now to ensure that post-Brexit, they have an economy which is vibrant. If economy goes down, you already have lost 18% the value of the pound. If you don't put in things together, you will reach the end of two years. And then even after two years, you can't do, and it's a hard Brexit, which in my case, if I look around me, 
it's going to be a hard Brexit. There's no way it's going to be a soft Brexit. If you leave it to industry in both EU and UK, it will be a soft Brexit. But the problem is the people who are negotiating are political animals. And political animals, they're already the rhetoric is very high on both sides. And after the um, German and French elections, if by some chance the right wing gets into power, imagine the rhetoric. Of course, somebody told me that uh, in two years' time there'll be no EU left, so there's nothing to negotiate about. But that is just hope. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so the point with it is post Brexit, India and UK would have done the same thing they would have done whether there was a Brexit or not. And we are going to do much more. Investments will come in. Right now, what has what this whole process has done, it's made people wary. Uh, investments are not coming in as much as they should come in. That is probably economic cycle because uh, Mahindra just bought a company last week, which is a motorcycle company in UK. And like my friend Pascal said, it's cheaper now to buy in UK than it was before. 18% fall in value is a big thing. Uh, for investments into India, it has become difficult for UK companies to invest because their value of investment has gone up by 18%. I mean, if I had planned 1,000 crores of investment, now it takes more pounds to do 1,000 crores than before. So these are small glitches which will happen. But this will continue. The, there is too much of synergy between both sides not to continue. We just need the political players to put in the right atmosphere for this to take off. Uh, it still hasn't taken off because of many reasons. I mean, agreed, our trade is much below. But let's say, let's say, let's look at the FTA. FTA. What are the two most big, biggest sticking points between India and Europe? One is tariffs on automobiles and wines and spirits. We can give tariff reductions on automobiles to UK because you're going to send us Jaguars, which is ours anyway. <laughs> so. <laughs> So, wines and spirits, I mean, technically India drinks more scotch whiskey than is produced in Scotland. So, I mean, it, it's not, not undoable. We can do it. But the other side is difficult, which is we want access for mode four and mode one issues. Where there is some hesitation on the UK side. But again, it's UK's call. Post-Brexit is they who have to decide whether for their own country they need a deal or not. We are ready to talk and we are ready to help UK in dealing with any situation post-Brexit. But it's for UK to take a call and we are ready to. And like I told you, we're not going to pull them down. Friends stand by friends in times of crisis and we're going to stand by UK at this time of crisis. There's no question about it. The point is, will UK stand by UK in this time of crisis? And that's the main question. There are many issues I can talk about. Um, yeah, we can do it, but I think we'll uh, tackle it in the question answer session if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you all very much indeed for, for uh, most interesting presentations and comments and presentations of views. Um, you're sitting in the university in the UK that's probably got the highest proportion of, of overseas students in the whole country. And it's, it's very interesting that the prospect of Brexit has actually increased our student body this year, um, particularly from continental Europe. Uh, we assume this is because students are coming to study at SOAS sooner rather than later because of uncertainty about what might happen to tuition fees um, in the years in the years to come, but also makes us very makes this university particularly vulnerable to those to those uncertainties. And our our director actually reported to academic board last week the that number of university organisations, UUK and others, have have taken data um, to show that putting international students into the overall immigration figures is, as you said, uh, sir, you know, very much contrary to the UK's interests, but um, came up with, with really no, very little in way of the positive response, because it's, it's clearly a deeply political position here, um, which I think we can all see is not in the UK's interest, but it's a very difficult one to, to shift. So thank you again, for all, all of you, for your very interesting comments and presentations. I wondered if any of you would like to 
to add to what you said in the light of what you've heard from other panellists um, before I open it to the floor? Are there other further things that have occurred to you? No? Um, okay, well, in that case, we'll open it to the floor. House, house rules are, are that you please say, before you ask your question, you, you say who you are and, and where, you, where you're coming from. Um, and if you could keep your questions and comments fairly brief, as we have limited time, um, we'd be very grateful. So I see... I see a hand at the back there, please, if we could start with you. Yes. Um, so I, I can comment anecdotally. I, I'm uh, I'm in the UK office, so probably I can only talk about UK. But anecdotally, from what I've heard from um, uh, colleagues, particularly in Belgium, um, in Baden-Württemberg, in Germany, and in in France, they are certainly looking at increasing the presence in India in terms of um, engaging much more, but. It, particularly in two or three cities in India, uh, engaging with Indian businesses at a much earlier stage. Uh, so each, each of these regions or each of these countries already has a, a presence in India, but it's a question of for them looking at whether they increase their presence, whether local presence or, or have people from the home countries coming in. Um, and when, um, as you know, when Prime Minister Modi was here, he was asked a question uh, around... Uh, around uh, UK's role in, in Europe, and he said that Indian companies very much see the UK as a gateway to Europe. So that, I think, that is still the case today. So Indian companies would still see London in particular, but, but the UK more widely as a gateway to Europe. But if it is less of a gateway to Europe, then Indian companies will see uh, uh, London and the UK a bit differently. Having said that, um, London mayor and uh, the deputy mayor, who, who's Indian himself and a very successful tech entrepreneur himself, um, a great kind of rags to riches story of, of um, him coming to London and setting up a business and, and growing. They, in the last couple of months, have been very vociferous in saying that London in particular is open for business. Um, so I think there are, there are certainly moves from, from within the UK and across Europe to to engage much more regularly and, and much more robustly with, with Indian business. Um, can, I, can, I, can I say this one? One thing is for sure, most Indian companies are not going to move out of UK unless it becomes really difficult. I mean, for most Indians, the only language they'll understand is English anyway. <laughs> So this is going to be their first place of stop. So it's, it's going to take a lot of negativity for Indian companies to really move away from UK lock, stock, and barrel. They'll have a presence. If, if it necessitates, they will do it. But what is happening is a lot of UK companies and a lot of foreign companies based in UK, which have dealings with India, are actually moving a lot of offices to India. Uh, in the last uh, two or three months, I have heard of many companies, some Japanese companies, some other companies, which are moving a large number of jobs to India. And basically because what is happening, many of these companies cannot get the right kind of people from India to come here. Um, I won't name this, a company which is moving almost 1,400 jobs to India, which is, which is a big number. Uh, and this is something which we're telling the British government, I mean, UK government, is that if you do not allow short-term people to come here to feed into these companies, you will have them move the jobs there, which is which is what you're going to lose anyway. So that's that's how.